Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality-expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre, with your host, Lonnie Scott. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, once again, back is the incredible, rhyme edible, you must know this man's name. Aiden Walker. Welcome back to Weird Web Radio, my friend. It is great to have you. Thank you, Lonnie. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm all right. I was thinking about doing that wrestling intro, and I fucked it up a little. I didn't have a big enough crowd. <laughs> uh, I could have screamed if I'd known I was needed. It was required. Yeah. <laughs> I've got all these buttons up here with Zencaster. And if, <laughs> if any of you out there are thinking about starting a podcast, check out Zencaster.com. It's powered the show for years. Um, and they, they have all these buttons to push on the paid version i can program things in there oh, <laughs> I, right. should, I should put crowd noise <laughs> oh yeah I, it's it, it's like having ableton live pre-built for you for a podcast yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> all right man uh you have been on a personal hiatus from the world at large for a couple years a couple years you're looking good and healthy thank you and, um glad to see your face and um I guess where I want to start with this one, since we, you know, you and I talk anyway, and I thought, let's see where we go with this. Uh, we will get into a significant portion of listener questions because people were pretty excited to hear you're coming back. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I, I'm excited to have come back. So, yeah. Um, you've made some moves physically. You've, you've left where you were. You've moved into new areas. You've ex- done some exploration and all this time that's gone by. Um, have you encountered any new local folklore or anything like that that's stood out and really got you excited? <laughs> <and curious? laughs> um, where I live, the only the closest thing I got to this is that there is a subsector of people that that share this belief, and it's known to be bullshit, which is why I love it. <laughs> it's purely just like a, it, it's somebody made a statement, God knows when, and. It's just held, and it's. I think I, it's. It's pretty. It's probably pretty small, and I think it's centered in the the younger contingent there. But we have two kinds of squirrels here. We have like your standard little brown tree squirrel, not the big gray ones like where I'm at in Southern Oregon. But um, but then we also have the. I don't know if it's the males versus the females or whatever. But some of them are like so dark that they're almost black. So they they look mm-hmm. black. So they're black squirrels, and. Um, I mentioned to someone one day that I had seen this black squirrel and, uh, and I said, it's, it's, it, 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 it's very cool, but I've only ever seen one of them at a time. And they like gave me this total, like, like a smile that was clearly that I had like passed the secret handshake. And they said, you know why that is? And I said, no, I said, because there's only one. Oh. And it just <laughs> translocates or whatever throughout the city. Now, of course, having been there now for a couple of years, I've seen them together, but this is kind <laughs> of a running theme that it is one. It has a, a name, which I won't share in public because I think it's sure. a secret. But uh, so, yeah, when you see this, this, when you see this black squirrel, you should generally refer to it by this name because it is just one. Uh, yeah. I think it's kind of awesome. It's kind of like they've generated this weird little town wide egregore about this squirrel. Right. Now, I guess that leads to the question would you hook up into something like that magically for any kind of sorceress reasons? <laughs> oh, totally. Totally. <laughs> Absolutely. Already have. Already um, have. Yeah. Because you go, that's like this super like emissary to the whole zone, right? Because you, you see him everywhere. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like kind of nod to, to Dara. It's the squirrel in black, right? Or the dark squirrel. Um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I just loved it. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, but that's the only thing that I've seen out, uh, that has been connected to anybody else. You and I have talked, um, you know, the, I, I, I have a, uh, 
an interesting relationship with the owls where I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, a couple bodies of water where I am. But uh, as far as outright more folklore or specific spirits, that's the only one that I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is a, there, there are active working shrines in my area out in the woods, but I don't know who's, I don't know who they think, who, who the other people are connecting to it. I kind of use them as uh, portals into the general land spirit of the area. So that's interesting. Um, wh when you are out, I'm, I'm sure you're hiking trails or on your bike. Yep. <laughs> um, and you see something that you think this is like, this is a, shrine or some sort of ritual location what what's given off that vibe to you how do you recognize them um the feral ones i guess <laughs> some of them are clearly that um there's a uh, some pretty large scale um structures that have been built with um you know deadfall branches and things at times um, some of those are kind of on the main drag. Some of them are kind of off in the, in the sticks. Um, and <laughs> then some of them are specific places like where there are, um, hollowed trees that people are clearly leaving offerings in. Mm. Um, and this is generally at one point, somebody had put a tarot card in there and that was in there for a while. But other than that, it's all been whatever's in the kind of general area. Uh, so at one point, um, you know, I found a, a wing from like an owl strike, you know, a small, smaller bird that had been taken out by an owl given a pile of feathers. Uh, and, uh, uh, I grabbed a couple feathers off of that. Um, but the next time that I went by one of these hollowed out trees, that, that feather, that the, the whole wing had been put in there in kind of like a bed of pine boughs. Oh, wow. Um, so people are actively doing work. You can see it. And then you can, you know, I'm not the most energetically sensitive all the time, but both of those, as soon as I got into the area, I could tell something was up. That's, it was like, okay, somebody's doing stuff in here, or this is a natural power spot, you know? Yeah. Now, I've noticed since you've come back on Instagram with the kind of things that you're posting on there, um, you seem to be very active or involved in exploring the, 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 the wilder environment around you, the more natural environment. Yeah. All right. Um, is there something about your, your personal practice that's kind of developing and going in that direction? Um, yeah, you know, I started working more than kind of, my basic sigil magic and occasional candle magic. Um, when I started making jewelry, which I started making jewelry again in, I think 2011. And then I started actually, um, offering it, uh, in 2012, I think maybe 2013, but right on the edge of those two years. Um, and so I was in the backwoods of Tennessee and we were on property. I had uh, a 50 acre property of hardwood forest. So I was doing some stuff in the back in there, but we were, I was so busy between the jewelry and, you know, we had between 25 and 75 chickens. We had goats, we had dogs. Um, it was a lot of work just doing that and big gardens. Um, so I wasn't doing a lot out in the woods there. And I'm also, um, what is a non, what is an appropriate term? I am a little bit wimpy about the ticks. Yeah. And our forest was a serious tick farm. Uh, so a lot of the time I wasn't a good place to go and do what I like to do outside, which is actually just find a place, get, sit in the dirt and chill. Uh, Cause it was all hardwood forest and heavily forested. Um, so I didn't do as much as I could have there. Whereas here, and then when I was in the desert more overtly, uh, I did stuff outside a lot. Um, but it wasn't really my kind of native zone. It's like, I'm a forest creature. Um, and so being back to the, you know, kind of Western U S forest world, um, 
I try and get out for a couple hours every day, kind of rain or shine and be out in the forest. Um, and yeah, so I do a lot of work out there. And then um, something I haven't done since my 20s when I was just foraging poisonous plants, basically, um, is I've begun trying to learn what's kind of actual magical or healing plants in the area oh, and learning yeah. the tr- learning the trees. Because like I've always been like, it's always been home, but I never studied it. And that's part of what my phase is right now. It's like, okay, I want to know all the trees where I'm at. I want to know uh, what's here. And I want to figure out how I can work with it, with those things. Not in the sense that I think I'm going to become an herbalist or a wild crafter, you know, there's, but uh, I already use like Hawthorne tincture. So why not wild craft that myself? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, Currently, I've got, I don't know, 600 hawthorn berries drying in my house. Um, and then, you know, the frost just hits. And I can collect rose hips to dry those and use those for teas and stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm more involved in the out, outdoors now, uh, mm-hmm. which is my preference. Uh, nice. And I have, a, you know, I just have access to a lot of forest and a lot of forest trails and a lot of uh, a lot of mountains between the bike and the foot. So, okay. Well, we got a lot of questions. <laughs> Let's, see them. Let's check them out. We got a lot of questions. So I want to start with my Patreon folks first. Cool. Um, let's see here. And Hey, just I'll throw this out. So you don't have to anybody that asks a question that I don't want to answer. I'm just going to tell you, I'm not going to answer it. And I'll tell you why. Hey, right, Nice. So that makes it super easy, but know that it's never going to be personal. It's just that it might be personal for me. It's not anything about you. You're welcome to ask anything when I come here, but I also get to say no. That's a perfect response to that. I like that. All right. They changed the app, and I don't know how to move around everything anymore. Here we go. <laughs> um, That's funny. My favorite one was just, oh, my God, yes, win. <laughs> <laughs> That's from Veronica. Thanks, Veronica. <laughs> All right. Miss J. Miss J asks, says, if I could ask Aiden Walker anything, I'd ask him what he thinks about the concept of composing music as spell work, not only as an offering, but as the actual wordless spell itself. That's um, interesting. And who asked that? Miss J. Hi, Miss J. I am super, super into that. Um, And it is something that I do a lot. Uh, I I took the stuff down off of Bandcamp uh, that I had up and just because it was done. But I think I had like 25 songs maybe up on Bandcamp and all of those were this that you're talking about. Um, And so... Uh, in that case, what I was doing was kind of coming with an intention or a spirit that I wanted to contact. Um, you know, and often it's the things that are, what I find really useful about music is it caters to statements of intention that aren't statable. Mm. Um, so instead of trying to translate that feeling sense that I'm after, I don't have to. I can just begin to try and create music with that. Um, and so for, for all of those, for the most part, those were all electric guitar. And I just just working in logic. Um, and so I would just create something that would function as kind of a baseline um, and then begin layering and just kind of keep honing into that feeling sense. Um, and remove anything that was dissonant with it and not really try to make it necessarily be a song. Like you heard that stuff. It was mostly more oh, yeah. like almost soundtrack stuff, you know, uh, yeah. rather than chorus verse, chorus verse stuff. It was usually very repetitive. Um, and that works really well for me. And I also do a lot of the same on my acoustic guitar. Uh, mm. I, 
when I was doing kind of singer songwriter stuff a long time ago, I didn't do that. I was just doing my, I want to be, you know, suicide blues, Johnny cash guy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, turns out the crossroads had other plans. They had other you. plans, <laughs> but, uh, I tend to find an open tuning that I like and that has that tonality and, and I can get to a tonality that works in the open tuning with a capo. Um, and then I will just kind of sit. And sometimes it's for something that I can state what it is, but I don't, but where the, the real core connection isn't really something that I can get words around. So I might know that it's about a relationship or about a book that I want to write, or it's about asking for a particular kind of vibe. And then I will try and find that feeling between the tuning and the key that it's in which I use the capo for because I don't, I'm not that good at any of this stuff to know. Ooh, I'm playing in this key. I don't know. <laughs> Same. I don't know either. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that when I play in dadgad, I'm mostly playing in D or G when I don't capo, but I could be wrong. Oh. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's hugely viable and it's very worthwhile. And I think for me, it opened up a real possibility to do work that I couldn't, describe to myself like i knew it mattered <laughs> um, i knew i wanted to bring magical energies to bear i knew it was somewhere in between often it's in between offering and ask it's mm -hmm. like um it's you know because it's there's more crossover i think to offerings and askings than someone who's specifically a devotional practitioner might be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, I, that's what I see all the time, pretty much. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question well, but yeah, I'm super into it. And I, I strongly suggest heavy experimentation there. It's very potent. Yeah. I like that. I, um, when I did the first, the first course with Jason Miller for sorcery of Hecate, mm -hmm. Um, there's this requirement in the sorcery of Hecate thing to do a hundred times a day, the EO Heca EO Ho, right? And then repeat it. And I think in part, Jason has people doing that as a matter of discipline, because we all know if you're going to get a lot out of this work, you've got to have a measure of discipline. You're going to have to just do things on days you don't want to, to get certain results. And now, some of that we could argue till this fucking sun goes down and back up again about the inner workings and mechanisms and the values and where all that idea comes from. But I've just found that generally to be true. Um, anyway, I was fucking around with my guitar one day after I did my hundred and out of nowhere, this simple little thing comes to me and I start playing it. And now I call it, uh, the dream of Hecate or Hecate's dream. And it's just a simple progression of notes that resonate with that specific chant. And it fulfills in my head, tapping into that current yep. that we're all tapping into. And I can do it with my guitar. I can do it sitting down with the chant, but either way, like it's, it, it did express itself musically to me, which I, yeah, no, that really makes cool. total sense to me. I, yeah. And I think that, you know, much that I think, uh, you know, in Changeling, I talk a lot about kind of the language around incantation and charming and that stuff. And this idea that these are essentially kind of sung spells, more or less, or kind of poetic spells. And I think that there's a ton of music that has done that. And again, where we tend to see it is in the overtly religious so we have hymns and that kind mm -hmm. of thing in various traditions. Um, but it can be a lot of, I think, I, I think anything, there's so much of the human experience that we, we either are experiencing, but can't find words for um, that, uh, or their poetry when we get there um, or that we just don't know how to express any other way. And I think that that's a totally viable path for, for magic. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of specific like genre of music or kind of music that 
kicks you into like magic mode immediately, flips that switch. Um, a lot of the Toreg blues stuff um, does for me. Uh, like Terracaft um, is great. Uh, as far as kind of uh, kind of explicitly re- Western stuff. Um, I don't use it while I'm working, but uh, Wardruna and Hailing mm. um, both are very good for me kind of in, like if I'm, yeah, like if, when, if I'm processing like my Hawthorne berries or stuff and I want just want something going on, I'll go to something like that. Um, and it's either that stuff or a lot of instrumental post-rock, a lot of stuff from mono. Uh, somebody that I've pushed forever and I just don't un- understand why everybody in the pagan community hasn't just gone crazy over her is Joe Quayle. Uh, she's done work with Mono and Mercur and uh, I think Wardrina at this point. Um, uh, but she's a fantastic classical cello player who is also mm-hmm. a metalhead and super into like really fucking gnarly shit with looping um uh yeah her record five incantations is a great place to start there but all of her stuff is very good um and uh yeah she's amazing what else is in that and then um earth for me is always the one you know uh dylan carlson's earth um which is again mostly instrumental one of their albums has a couple vocal tracks on it but uh, and Dylan, you know, he's got the, he's got the, uh, protection against witchcraft and the other big charm from, uh, Reginald Scott's discovery of witches tattooed on the backs of his hands forever. Nice. Uh, that lets you know where Dylan's brain is, you know, <laughs> he had them that. before they were cool. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh uh, man, for me, I would say, you know, like Ward Runa in particular, uh, there are things, that especially that, that that they do musically with their voices alone, that will take me into that. I'm going to do very deep spirit kind of trance work. Sometimes they can take me there, um, but when I'm just getting down with sigils or working magic for some particular reason, you know, like for me, it's electronic music, trance, some, some more obscure house music that I really know back from my DJing days, right. you know, things, things like that, that, that gets me. There's a track out there called club to death. Like if you hear that playing and you walked up to my, my home at the front door and you hear that coming out, leave me the fuck alone. I am busy. <laughs> Right, totally. <laughs> and I'm deep in it too. Like that stuff to me is always just like flick the switch for me. The world just instantly feels otherworldly, non-ordinary, you know, as you've talked about, like in six ways, the difference between ordinary and non-ordinary. Absolutely. And that takes me across that bridge in a moment. Yeah. If the, if the music just sounds just right. You know? Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that I do that with that, that I'm very much there. So like kind of my, yeah, just get down with sigil stuff, that kind of thing. Um, I just can't have lyrics in English. Mm. Uh, and so that can be anything if it's depending on what I'm after, like Ana Moro, who is Fado, uh, Portuguese, fucking heartbreaking shit. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, what else was the other one that I was going to say? Oh, uh, Solstafir from Iceland, uh, is great for that though. I think they have an album that has some English lyrics now, but their earlier stuff did not. That's very good for that. And, uh, what is, oh, uh, uh, there is a band and I think that they might be Brazilian. I'm not sure. Um, or Argentina, maybe Argentina called Los Natas. Okay. Uh, and, uh, they are like super fucking heavy old school Sonora rock, <laughs> but it's all in Spanish. So I have no idea what they're singing about. Uh, <laughs> And fucking great. And that is like major yeah. magic music to me. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Hey, so if you start speaking Spanish or Icelandic, you're fucked. You're gonna have to find a whole have new, to find something else, you know. A whole new thing. Some of wow. Gojira's stuff works for me on that level too. So Yeah. We had a lot of fun off of that one quick question, didn't we? Thank you, oh, Miss Jay. Um Shana. Shana Casey from the Patreon folks says first Thank you, Aiden, with an exclamation point. Says, your books, especially Changeling, have had a strong, positive impact on their practice. Then goes on to say, I'm working on my personal energy leaks in witchcraft practice and wants to know what have you found to be the most useful for dealing with any of your own energy leaks? Hmm. Um, this is going to send me down a rabbit hole that I will state up front. I'm not qualified to discuss in any actual therapeutic way. Um, <laughs> he has medical disclaimers. We yeah, are not doctors. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm not a therapist, any of that shit. Um, the first thing is, uh, if you are aware that you have leakage, even if you don't know where it is, but you, you know, often I find this that like, is there work that I do that I end up super tired, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's resistance and it's worth looking at something like Stephen Pressfield's War of Art, where he's talking about the function of resistance and the, the function of resistance is to it within us. It's mostly what he's talking about, but is to t- it's, it's an attempt for us to kind of stifle our creativity so we don't change is how I would put it in a magical context. So you go, that's okay. So that's a good thing because it indicates you're on a right path if you're getting that resistance because if you weren't, you would never be no, no, right. no friction. Um, polyvagal theory uh, is the thing to look at. And I would specifically uh, send her to YouTube and look for uh, videos by uh, Suki Baxter, S-U-K-I-E, Um and there is one that you'll know if you kind of scroll through them, and it's polyvagal massage. But the one is specifically about some work in your ears. There's a lot of people talking about this, but her stuff has worked better for me than anybody else's. Um, a lot of the times what I now think is going on in our energy links is that we are... <sighs> I think we are culturally and societally wide, uh, basically overstimulated mm. in our sympathetic nervous system. Like I all agree. of us. Um, and this is kind of currently the big energy lake and it's super intentional because if everybody's in fight, flight or freeze mode, you can make them do whatever you want. Cause we don't have to, apply this to any conspiracy theory. Uh, this is just a general process and the stuff that I've gotten from learning to settle that down, that clears most of my energy leaks. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, would be to, uh, not just do clearing and cleansing work, but also do, uh, it's the specific power work, like what's in Changeling, um, work with that water exercise where you're running water through your hands mm-hmm. and realizing that you can then do that same thing with your physical energy um, or your uh, kind of magical psychic energy, whatever we want to call that. Uh, and basically like, yeah, it real it, do that in, a, in one of the other sections on the energy work there. I have you kind of um, reaching out and kind of raking the energy fields that are around you with your hands to kind of smooth out the tangles. Um, that helps a lot for me because what I find is what's it's again, and I think it's all tied to this kind of what I'll just call kind of anxiety states or anxious states is that our energy really gets bound up in these little tangles. And whether you're actually doing anything when you're doing that thing, you can sense that you are changing your energy field. Mm -hmm. Uh, And some of that may be that that physical act of kind of doing it like you're raking through hair almost to smooth out tangles 
it's again, it's kind of like what we were talking about music. It's, this is a bodily way of showing your intention to yourself, to your allies, to the field. Uh, and see if that stuff works. And then kind of the last thing is to, if you're really aware that this is going on or you're pretty sure that you're aware, like collect an oil that you can wear everywhere. So maybe super tone it down if you have to. You know, you could use like an ounce of a carrier oil, like a hoba or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and just a drop or two of something that's got some potency to it, whatever that is for you. It does not have to be overt. It's not about the, it's energy signature, not the, not that the whole neighborhood knows you smell like patchouli. Um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, and basically do the whole process. You can use, uh, there's things in Changeling, there's things in Six Ways, and there's things in Weaving Fate. Weaving Fate gives the most explicit things, I think. Consecrate the fuck out of that thing, as, that oil, as a tool to seal your energy link, leaks. And after you take any kind of bath, whether it's a ritual bath or not, take a few minutes to kind of go over your body with that stuff and just kind of touch points. You don't have to coat yourself in it. Mm -hmm. And in time, you'll get led to where those points are. Like, again, put your mind to what you're trying to do, your attention and your intention, and it'll eventually show you. You could Because you could have something really weird, like going like, okay, like I have a point on the back of my left hand and two points above my pelvis on the back that if I hit those, everything clears out mm. and everything tightens up. It's not, it's kind of like part of this thing is we're almost like doing a, like a self-exploratory kind of acupuncture meridian thing kind of as magicians. Like yeah. we don't have the map for this stuff. Uh, so you kind of just have to be willing to, to go in and explore and go, okay, I think this could be it. And so let's play and see what happens. And the, and the nice thing about that well, that I find is having done that kind of work for many years, sometimes I'll get up, feel a little funky, and I will pick up my bottle of oil that I use for this and go, okay, I want it on my hands and I want it behind my knees and I'm done. I don't really think about it. Mm -hmm. It's not a cognitive thing. Uh, it's not me sorting through all of the possibilities to make a decision about what my brain and my conscious mind thinks is right. Uh, effectively, another way of viewing this is there's a woman whose videos I really like that will completely freak out at least a bunch of the men listening to this if they go watch her, but her name's Sabrina Lynn. She's on YouTube. Uh, and, uh, she refers to that we have the traditional kind of view of the shadow, right? Of the stuff that we repress that we're uncomfortable with because we view it as bad, but that there's another aspect of the shadow that she calls the golden shadow, which is all of this power. And so a lot of the way, what I'm thinking about, if I'm to use that language, is a lot of the practices that I'm talking about, that we're talking about today, are ways of kind of connecting to that golden shadow. Like there's parts of you that know what to do if you can get the parts of you that don't want that to be done out of the way. And part of that comes just from actually doing the work anyway, even if it's totally haphazard initially, because eventually it goes, fuck, he's doing it anyway. <laughs> yeah. I can't actually stop him. So maybe I'll get out of the way. And then a little bit down the road, you go, ah, okay. Now I'm starting to hone in on what's the best use of this or the best mm -hmm. places to work. I would add too that that whole kiss thing, right? Keep it simple, stupid. You know, like don't overcomplicate these things. I think a lot of times this is becoming, or this is an more an issue where you need to become more embodied, more centered yes. in your body. Something I teach all of my hypnosis clients, particularly the ones that come to me for stress and anxiety, which I would wager has some some form of whatever we're calling energy that energy leak element to it absolutely is a thing called bilateral stimulation. I love this exercise. And what I recommend that you do is get something in your hand that is, you can hold comfortably in your hand that feels wonderful to you, <laughs> like mm -hmm. stimulates your skin in a way that you enjoy holding it. I like holding squishy things or soft 
furry things. You know, if, if there's a chihuahua nearby, I might grab it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but what you want to do is just, you know, rest your gaze in front looking forward and just kind of let your eyes follow as you slowly pass this item back and forth in front of you in a pinch, you can do it with your phone, right? But you just want to just slowly hand it off one hand to the other in front of you and let your eyes kind of restfully go back and forth. And I'm doing it right now. You can't see me, but Aiden can. And uh, anyway, as you're doing this, what you're doing is you are triggering your brain to incorporate both hemispheres into the activity. So if let's imagine that your your brain is a town, right? And if you're in that state of feeling energy leaks or having heightened anxiety, you're going to, let's imagine like everyone in town has gone to the movie theater. So they're all there and the movie's scary. (laughs) So it's causing some issues. When you start doing something like bilateral stimulation, you are telling everyone in town, you don't have to watch a scary movie. You're not stuck there. Go back home, feel comfortable, go to your favorite place to chill, go back and relax. Everything's fine. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's a simple embodied practice that will make you do that. So I just wanted to add that to the list that Aiden provided you. Yeah. There's another really interesting thing that comes out of, I want to say it comes out of maybe Peter Levine's somatic experiencing stuff. I'm not sure though. It might also come from Stephen Porges polyvagal theory stuff. And I, and I don't remember the source of it, but one of the theories that comes out of this kind of embodiment view of, A lot of the stuff is trauma-based because that's where it came from was people doing research there. Um, But if you kind of dive in, it often means something a little different than what a lot of us think trauma is. Um, But this particular thing that I, I wish I could remember who I got it from is they're basically saying that because we are born totally helpless... You know, it's like there's a lot of most animals in the world can be born. And if their caretakers die, it's not guaranteed (laughs) that they do. Right. (laughs) That is a little different. Yeah. (laughs) That is not true for us, you know. Uh, um, That what they're basically saying is that we share nervous systems, that our our nervous system naturally will engage with the nervous systems of the people around us. And this is a process they they call Mm co-regulation. So like say that I'm upset and you are not, we can have this whole story like, Oh yeah, well when I'm upset and I'm hanging around with Lonnie, uh, I feel better. And this is some skill Lonnie has. Well, it's not necessarily a skill Lonnie has. Lonnie's (laughs) been feeling pretty good that day and is chill. And if he doesn't get wound up with me, my nervous system can begin to kind of entrain to his. Mm -hmm. But the opposite can happen, I think, which is that I can also then start making Lonnie really agitated, right? That's true. Because I'm agitated. And we can see this. We can see this on a global scale right now, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, There has been a push to co-regulation towards total chaos and destruction. Um, And so... Again, sinking it, is it an energy link or are you surrounded by energy fields that you can never get to a calm space with? Mm. Um, and so it kind of makes sense to see if you can figure out where you can go to do this. I think this is one of the attractions to like beyond the physical attraction, uh, the obvious physical reasons for things like yoga or group meditation spaces is that if you're rolling into the monastery, everybody's co-regulating down into this very specific pattern. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't super matter that you can get there initially. Uh, it's just, if you're going to keep sticking yourself there every day for several hours a day with a bunch of monks that have been <laughs> doing this for years, you're going to chill out or you're going to blow up if you're not actually down, you know, right. So it's something else to think about is it, and you know, I'm pretty sure that that's in six ways that I talk about that, but sometimes it's not necessarily that you have an energy link that is anything other than boundary issues. And some boundary issues can only be resolved by not being where you are, or where it's a problem because you don't oh, get to control other yes. people. Yeah. But you do get to move your ass out of them. Yeah. Um, 
oh my god mitch horowitz is the one i saw hammering home on this for a while and it stuck in my head it's, it's so true it's so important and it's such a simple message and hard to accept if you are in a in a situation work professional relationships love romance whatever you name it if you are in a situation that is toxic taking away your energy literally making you miserable or worse leave it and if you can't start right now today making a plan on how you can (laughs) absolutely and and, and there's an important piece in there which is we are such a blame-based culture particularly right now there's not necessarily any blame involved uh there's stuff that just doesn't work between people yeah um and so it's not that because what we do and i what i've heard Mitch talk about this too. And the important thing is if we take it out into the social media world, a lot of the time what we see is toxic people. And I'm not saying there aren't toxic people because there are people who are pretty fucked up and they, these are the people that we would qualify as toxic people at a certain point, but it's the relationship between that is toxic. Uh, There are people that that person would be beautiful for. Right. The combo may not be anything any of us want to be around. Right. (laughs) Um, and so it's not about that person being bad, that being a toxic person. And this is, I'll go back to this on the, one of the things that I found great help from comes from where I heard it at least came from Gabor Mate, who's a big deal right now in trauma work. But in what he said that I never heard put quite this way, but even in weaving fate, I was kind of pointing at this was, We talk about traumatic events and then we judge whether that should have been a traumatic event uh, for someone. He goes, but trauma is never an event. Trauma is an experience. Mm. So something that is overtly fucking heinous that everybody would agree is a traumatic event uh, in that one view may not have a traumatic effect on everyone that it happens to. Right. Right. And so that ties into that same thing, like remove the blame from that. It's, it's like remove the did what happened. If you're aware of what happened to you, that kind of has set you up in some ways to be in that state. Um, You can't, really make the judgment of, oh, but that wasn't bad enough or harsh enough or severe enough to have had the output that it did in your life. Because it's not about the event. It's about how you experienced it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then a lot of the stuff we're talking about is then, and then it also becomes how you remember it, which goes back into weaving fate again, you know, is because our, is, is your memory process actually doing kind of producing more harm now than whatever things went go. I mean, this is kind of the argument for radical forgiveness is it's not about forgiving the other person. In my opinion, it's about letting go of, there's a great quote. I think it came from Lily Tomlin that said, um, forgiveness is letting go all hope of a better past. (laughs) Yes. And wow. so it has nothing yes. to do with absolving somebody else for their actions. Cause there's a fuck ton of actions. None of us, no one can absolve any of us for, mm-hmm. right? What's done is done. You don't get to do that. Uh, but it is about, okay, I'm not going to carry that anymore. To me, it's about putting down my side of it. Yeah. Uh, I don't have to tell anybody that it happened. It's just like I have to get to actually done so that I'm not carrying that and go, okay, yeah, that was not what I would have liked. <laughs> so what? Right. Move on. And it's easier said than done. And I'm don't, not making it light is. of that at all. I've got years of work on this shit. Um, but yeah, all that stuff works. It does. And I, I think you even touched on this kind of in a way when it comes to magic and whatnot. I know in six ways, somewhere in there, you got into man how did how was it? like the idea of you know true believing something's true deciding something's true versus it actually maybe being true mm-hmm. and what that does magically speaking um 
and and that's a nice thought experiment too like i and i think that's part of what you were doing with weaving fate is like how does your life change if you decide something was true even though maybe you are not going to line up the facts in a way to make it big t true right yeah right because and that's and, and, and that goes back into that whole thing that the biggest thing that I've got in the last few years is, is how much our reality is, 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 is body, how much of it is totally tactile and tangible. Um, and so we can kind of th- <laughs> I had this left. I had a conversation with somebody in the other world that uh, he didn't show, but I was in there and, and this thought popped up in my head and, uh, it was, it, and my thought was, we have this term. We used to use it a long time ago, and you will know it. I don't know if it, it is still used, but um, about where, where they would, I would, somebody would say about somebody else, couldn't think his way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> you remember yeah. that one? Oh yeah. Yep. And, I, and and I thought this because I was just drifting, and some some somebody like flat like basically highlighted that line for me <laughs> while I was in this <laughs> trancy state and I was like that's a really fascinating one because you can't think your way out of a paper bag <laughs> you can choose to do something about it <laughs> but thinking about it doesn't do anything <laughs> <laughs> you could die in there you know? right because <laughs> uh, the body has to become involved uh and i think uh you know maybe with uh how digital the world is and how much we're engaged in kind of constant thinking and input output through uh not things we don't touch in the same way we touch dirt or we touch like i feel the road on a bike differently than i do in a car Oh, uh, yeah. You know, uh, I feel it in my lightweight running shoes different than I do in my boots, you know, and uh, in a way we've kind of set up the world to, to give us less physical information. Uh, and so we, everything becomes this, let's think our way out of this. It's like, <laughs> no, you got to do something. Yeah. Got to do something. I love how we're we're going down these rabbit holes and we're covering some of these questions that are going to on my <laughs> list here to ask too. Um, wow, that was a lot of fun. Um, we've moving from Patreon, going to um, a Facebook group called Six Ways Weaving Fate and Beyond. If any of you are out there and interested in Aiden's work and on Facebook, I encourage you to come join us. Uh, me and a couple other people run this thing and. Um, it's an open platform to, to get dig into your experiences and questions and such along, you know, using Aiden's published work. So in that group, we had uh, Melita asked a shit ton of questions all on their own. <laughs> awesome. And we covered most of this as we were talking. Um, something I'm, I can tell by the likes and whatnot that people are, are going to be curious about. So I'll go ahead and ask, even though I think I know the answer. Um, are you going to be teaching a workshop or classes again? Uh, that's such a, an interesting question. Cause up until very recently, I would have said no. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, I'm not going to, I can't announce it because it's not solidified, but I will probably be teaching a one shot uh, co taught class with somebody in the next year. Very cool. And I actually just came across, a, for me, I'm like super, there's only so much work I'm willing to do to do any of the stuff that I do publicly. So like books for me are work that I can do. I can do very limited kind of internet use in general. Um, And so I'm working on kind of figuring out what platforms work. And Lonnie Mm -hmm. and I have talked about this privately and I won't go into the specifics, but part of what I'm doing now is kind of searching platforms for things like teaching that might be might be viable or they're, they're going to be robust enough for the students to get what they want without it being an insane amount of work for me on the back end. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
not on the teaching side, but just the administration side. And I think I found one. So I'll be digging into that in the next six months or so and figuring out if I can actually use it. Nice. All so right. possible. Okay. Um, that is, this one feels personal, but I'll, I'll float it out there. Um, Danny asks, uh, well, that's a question just saying would be interested in hearing your results from your own black book work. Um, my life as it is. Um, <laughs> that is the result of my black book work. Um, so one of the things that I put in to weaving fate that is kind of for me, the key to it all is that I don't believe that the black book is suited particularly well to the same kind of results magic of traditional sigil or traditional ritual work where we're going in and making a stated ask. Uh, I want this. I want it like this. Um, The black book seems to be really good at... And I know I use these two words together in the book in, in Weaving Fate a lot. Subtle and radical changes. Um, <laughs> meaning that it's usually not I write 50 entries in the black book and then boom, my life has done a 180. What I find is that I do multiple black books over the years and my life keeps subtly shifting in a way (laughs) that I realize that it looks a little bit like if I were to have stuck, uh, you know, those, uh, uh, I can't think what they're called, but the little sensors they stick on, on, uh, on people when they're going to do the, uh, video capture, the motion capture to make video games or do matrix Kyle effect. Oh, it's like yeah. if you stuck I that don't on, know what that's called. Yeah. I don't know what that's called, but it's a little bit like if you stick that on Tony Hawk before he drops into the half pipe. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I find it to be totally transformative, but I can almost never pick the place where it transformed. Um, but that everything is kind of, it's almost like it's a rolling shift. Uh, and my life becomes more and more related to the overall content of the black books. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's a, it's an, so it's, it's tough to say what it is. I mean, I can lay out a bunch of that. My jewelry business entirely based on black book work. Um, where I went from that to where I am now entirely based on black book work. Um, it is the main way that I actually try and guide my life. Uh, I do a lot of small stuff, but I wouldn't say that that's trying to guide my life with it. Uh, though I am working on, uh, a kind of convergence of, uh, using the kind of ideas about the black book that are in weaving fate as kind of an approach to using other kinds of magic to try and get to a similar effect because i know that some people have trouble with the writing aspects um and so looking at can i create a framework for people that is uh similarly effective but uh uh not as writing intensive yeah i would think that music like we talked about earlier would be a definite avenue like that i mean our friend our mutual friend luxa lux estrada who does the incredibly interesting Luxical podcast um, does a shit ton of experiment with sigils and things like that musically. And yeah, and I would throw, I, yeah, I'm going to throw that out that for anybody who's looking for really interesting magical work right now, uh, please check out uh, Luxa, her podcast in the Green Mushroom Project. Uh, yes. it, is the, it is, I'm not a group guy in general, but. Um, that's really cool work. That is, it, it, it's, it's focused, it's clear, it's intentional. And I think it is, uh, from what I've seen, it, it, it's working very well for her and for the people she's working with. 
Yeah, I would I would say for a current of like a magical experiment, it's laid out for you to tap right in. There's a fucking amazing community of people who have dove deep into this shit. So there's plenty of stuff in the archives for you to get inspiration. Um, the Green Mushroom Project. Type that into Google in a different window right fucking now. Lux Lux Occult Podcast Green Mushroom Project. Comp and and. Come back and thank me later. <laughs> yeah, because it's really cool stuff out there. But yeah, she's definitely mixed the visual and the audio and all of that stuff in a very interesting way to do that. Um, yep. You know, I think one of the things that one of the things that I got back feedback from on Weaving Fate that there's stuff that I don't. There's stuff that I think that if I put it in, I put a lot, I put most things in my books very overtly and very clearly, but there's always subtext in them. And the subtext is, I always leave it that way because if people come to their own conclusions, it'll have power. But that's one of the things in Weaving Fate is really kind of looking at how do we structure work in a long-term thing that's not a case of putting out fires or trying to get Mm -hmm. individual changes how do we use magic to really change the whole scenario we're in and i think there's lots of ways to approach that but uh music music sigils what if all of your sigils were one book of sigils what would you not do sigil magic for what would you do sigil magic for if every sigil affected every other sigil how would you maximize that Mm mm-hmm that's that's something I think about all the time. I mean, according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I've got most of my needs met right now. Mm-hmm. Magically speaking, I've got plenty of things I can think of to do to satisfy some physical things that just aren't vibing in my life at the moment. <laughs> but uh, if you're generally content in life, you know, what are you using magic for? How do you stay tapped in if you're not going after those basic love, money, security kind of right? Because it's it, it's interesting because I think yeah I'm very much there with you. It's it's kind of um, it's a question that I've asked that I ask myself. I ask it repeatedly when I'm writing books, and it's it, 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 and the thing is, if magic works, and I know that it does for me. Mm-hmm. then what does that mean for me, my life, and what I choose to do with it? And I think that that is a really good question to come back to and come back to and come back to. For some people, this is not, well, there's no question there. It's like it, magic is kind of a, I would say to the kind of devotional folks, um, it's usually directly linked to that. Um, but for folks that that's not their primary focus, it's kind of like, yeah, it's like, what do you do with this technology? If we want to call it that with this tool set that maybe you aren't doing yet, Mm -hmm. that would be beneficial to do. Uh, and that's super personal. It's, it's, again, it's like, we can say, you know, you go love money, sex, shelter, food. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, you know, health are the basics. Yeah. Well, then, pick, up, pick up any book on magic, just about, right? Witchcraft, magic, all of it. Just just about any of them. If there's a collection of spells in them, it's going to be to find love. It's going to be to get money. It's going to be to get the house you want and, you know, and so yeah. on, you know, and things centered around that, you know, it gets a little deeper, like protection and warding and things, but you're still talking about, Basic thing. More security, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and that's also one of the things that the, the, the changeling was part of about is like, what if I were to write a book that is not about those things very much? Like, that is really about what are the things that if I were living up to my ideals and what might they be and what might they mean and how are they meaningful? How would I use magic to? move me closer to living to that state, closer to walking my talk. Uh, knowing that this is always anybody who, who 
Yeah, the thinking you're perfect on anything, any point is usually the sign that you're anything <laughs> but, um, right? In my opinion, but uh, and I'm very well aware. It's like you remember that from me in the Facebook group when I was in the Facebook group was people would be like, "Oh, you are the master," and I'm like, "Don't even go there, dude. You have no uh, clue." Yeah, <laughs> no, no one has clue. ever worn the hat. I am not your fucking guru. Better. <laughs> <laughs> like no dude <laughs> no. uh you know but uh yeah it's so it's it's you know so so uh, you know changeling was in part that thing is like god what if i were working towards these personal qualities and what qualities do i work towards and can i make them explicit and i'll you know secret background to that is uh if you ask for that and you aren't doing that expect to get put in the situation to be that, which may not be a very fun ride. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I'm not going to get to everyone's question. I'm That's just right. gonna, I'm, I'm going to let everyone listening know that right away, because on one hand, we have gotten to a lot of your questions just through the course of the conversation and going down the rabbit hole and stuff. I'm kind of scrolling through and seeing like what what note could we really hit before we take off to the Patreon portion. Um, and the one I like, because there are a lot of questions here. I'm not, and I, this is one I think we've covered, but uh, there's a lot of people asking about your withdrawal from public life and how yep. that changed your practice and so on. But I feel like we've really covered that. It, if Is there anything more you want to add that maybe didn't come about? Yeah, basically. So this is just, and um, this is a totally good question. Um, so I got online again. I had been offline and out of the online magical community for about a decade when I got back on. It. A little more, actually, but. Um, and this so is going back from like Z cluster days. Yeah. To, so like I bailed re-emerge. out of the right. So I bailed out of the Z cluster right about the time that it moved to Yahoo groups. I may have been there very briefly, but I don't even remember that. I That's was, another thing that doesn't exist now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like to me, I was active online in the magical community during the Usenet days. Um, and that's when we founded the Z cluster. And uh, I was doing that. And when I got, I, you know, I had an, that was the, the second, my second experience with the man in black. Basically he said, back the fuck off. And so I did. Um, and, uh, continued to do my own work, but I stopped buying books pretty much stopped reading what was coming out for. So this must've been around maybe 99. Uh, and I didn't come back online until I found Sarah Lull, this is old Witch of Forest Grove site, um, in 2011, 2012, somewhere in there. And then I started making jewelry. So I had never been active on Facebook, any of that stuff before then. It's like, okay, I'll go on Facebook, uh, see if I can find some some magical folks. I'm sure they're out there. There must be a few. I had no fucking clue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I could share my jewelry there and maybe people will think it's cool and buy some. And that would be awesome because I'm working with silver is a somewhat expensive hobby. That was my initial thing. It's like, <laughs> if I sell them, I'll buy more silver and I can make more cool things, which is really what I want to do. Um, why that is relevant is that I did not expect to have the reception in the magical community that I did from that work. Sure. Um, but I'm still a jeweler. I'm just, and this is something that everybody in the community knows whether they know it or not. And this is changing for the young, the younger generation. But um, that stayed totally workable except volume. It's like, I was not good at saying, no, I'm not taking any orders for the next couple months. So it got a little backed up a couple times and that was a little stressful. Um, and then I wrote six ways. And I totally thought I'm going to sell like, I don't know, maybe I'll sell 2000 copies of this book and that would be fucking cool. (laughs) Um, I would be fucking stoked. And uh, I did that before it was printed. Uh, 
and was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens is then that puts you into this totally different camp, which any, many, many authors, you can find them talking about this in our community. Now you're an author and the floodgates kind of open if the books are well received. Um, and that was also fine. So I was doing jewelry. I had six ways. I could kind of manage the volume of incoming conversations, requests, mm -hmm. all that stuff pretty well. Um, and after Weaving Fate, that exploded. And all of a sudden, you're in this thing of like, ooh, why did I ever put a contact form on my website? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this has no, this is not to say I haven't absolutely enjoyed the vast majority of the conversations that came that way, but it got to a place where there were actually more of them coming through than I could actually manage in a day. Um, and man, I think about very specifically because he has exploded so much. I think about our friend Matt Oren, and you go, Ooh, "Oh yeah, <laughs> I hope he's got some serious buffers in place." Um, mm -hmm. And I think he does. He's a smart picky. But um, so what happened for me was I got to a place where I realized that I couldn't use social media the way that I had. Um, and so I started backing away from that. And what happened was then that turned all those communications into email. So it's like, fuck, okay. <laughs> this is, just, you know, this is nothing I'm complaining about because it's beautiful that that happened. But uh, it is amazing to me that people actually have any interest in, 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 in hearing my thoughts on it. But basically, I just got to a place where it's like, whoa, I, I came in as a jeweler. And I came in just to see if I could kind of make this hobby pay for itself and meet some people in the community. And it turned into a completely different thing uh, and with a really huge reach. And I had to decide what do I want to do going forward because I can't keep doing what I'm doing. It just ceased to work for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I backed out uh, and I shut down everything. We kind of, my publisher and I got together and, and we reformed the website to be this kind of recursive thing that like, if you get into the vac, it's pretty much like, and this is not at all uh, bullshit. Uh, if you look at the vac and you wonder why it is formatted as it is right now, that covers nearly every email that I get. Because <laughs> they can imagine. It really does. It's like, no, I, you can kind of go your own way. My message is you can go your own way and you have mm. to, unless you're in a tradition that is actually teaching you a specific way, you have to work it out on your own. That's kind of one big piece of it. Anyway, so we created this thing to try and just give me some space. Yeah. Um, and for me, I also realized like, no, I actually need total space. So Lonnie can tell you, Lonnie and I have not talked until recently. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, this was not, pointed at anybody. It was not pointed anywhere other than back at me going, okay, I got to take some space and I got to figure out how I'm going to proceed because what was, how it was going wasn't working anymore. Right. Uh, so now I'm in a position where it's much quieter. Um, I'm much harder to reach, which is again, I understand it's probably frustrating for some people because I was very open for a decade, um, but I absolutely don't have the bandwidth for it. Uh, what I do have the bandwidth for um, is writing books, talking to folks on these podcasts like Lonnie and, and uh, Luxa and Dara and Alex Eth and all the folks I do talk to, um, and then figuring out what I'm going to do to kind of create a space where I can actually interact with readers. Because uh, mm -hmm. one of the things, too, that people probably don't know if you aren't on this side is it gets really weird when you're a published magical author because you get a lot of inquiries for things that no one should be asking anybody about that they don't actually know that that person has a license to teach mm -hmm. that thing yeah um and i get it because the you know 
our, our general models for caring for each other in this society, particularly in the U S don't work. Um, but your general magical author is not necessarily the person that can help you with those things. And that became really difficult to figure out how to do, um, and how to manage. So yeah, basically I would say straight up. Yeah. Just realizing that I had vastly exceeded my bandwidth. And so I needed to just shut it off and fix a bunch of shit. Mm -hmm. uh, and take some time to really ha be able to ground out and go, okay, well, what parts of this are the most important to me and what parts are the most valuable? Cause I can answer an email and that helps one person, or I can talk to you about these things and we can go in depth. We can get some feedback going back and forth. Right. And this is available to thousands of people forever. Right. I can write a book which is then available to thousands of people for fucking decades. <laughs> yeah. Or I can answer that many emails, you know? So it's just a change. It was a necessary change and I needed a break. Yeah. And uh, am now in process of figuring out what happens next. Yeah. And, and that all harkens back to what we were talking about earlier about boundaries and, yeah. and understanding where your boundaries are for your own safety and your own mental well being. And it, it matters, folks. Um, hell, yeah. I had a time as a hypnotist when I backed away because I would get requests like you were talking about, like, I'm a hypnotist. I'm not a fucking <laughs> miracle worker. Um, some things that people would ask for, I just, it, it gets, it gets exhausting telling, finding out how to tell people no without crushing them at the same time. That's what it was for me. I didn't want to hurt someone by telling them no. Right. I wanted them to find the help they needed, but and, yeah, no, I just wasn't the guy for it. And it's tough because it's, you know, the, the way that we've set things up and, and, uh, it, in the society and in the, we're just going to categorize a lot of this stuff as mental health stuff. Cause that's how it's categorized, but it's not in the way that as most people out there probably know, those categorizations are really not particularly help, help, helpful for you as the end user. <laughs> right. um, and it sucks that that is not, that there's not a good solution to that yet. Um, and I get that a lot of us are kind of bootstrapping ourselves through whatever techniques we can um, or whatever different schools of thoughts we can. Uh, and yeah, for me, it was a tough decision because I loved the interaction. Uh, and so that was tough to go, Ooh. And that's really why I took the whole time off completely off is it's like, okay, I need to drop all of it and let it all settle out. Yeah. Um, the other piece there that is related to that. And I've talked about it. I don't know if it's in six ways or weaving fate, but, or whether I talked about it on a podcast is there's a point where you build up so much magical momentum that almost like the last thing you need to do is any more magic mm. other than whatever your basic kind of personal hygiene, magical hygiene kind of stuff is, or your offerings to your dead or ancestors or spirits around you, whatever. And I also think I hit that place where it's like, Oh, I just need to chill and let the last decades work sift. Yeah. Like you a know. surfer that found that big wave. Yeah. yeah. Ride the wave. <laughs> yeah. Ride the wave, ride it out, and then sit on the beach and see if that guy with the hibachi is going to bring you some shrimp. You know? <laughs> yes. don't, worry, don't, don't worry about going and getting on another one right yet. <laughs> I like it. Um, only other question I wanted to put here for the, the general public audience um, is something that I saw come up over and over and over again when um, Thorn Mooney who Thorne is still like, I want Thorne on the show and Thorne has not been on the show. So Thorne, if you're listening, <laughs> I want Thorne on the show. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, Thorne right. needs, if, if Thorne needs me to hold her hand while you're, she's on the show for some reason, I will sit silently on the show with her. <laughs> I want Thorne on the show. <laughs> me too. Thorne is one of those, like she's a gardenerian priestess. If you don't know who she is and, and, uh, has this epically useful YouTube channel and Patreon thing and is a, a skillful writer and thinks deeper thoughts about all the stuff that we all talk about. 
And I think Thorne's just a hugely, massively important voice in modern paganism in the occult. And Thorne would never accept that praise. And that makes me love her even more. So <laughs> yeah, all that, all that. Too. Yeah. Um, when she, she, on her Patreon, she does a thing where they have a book club. I'm a member of her Patreon and on discord, they, they have one of the most active, very involved groups I've ever seen on that. Um, six ways was one of their things for the, the book club. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a year or more ago now, I think, um, Something that came up over and over and over and over again, I noticed in the Discord was this one question. Is six ways, and I guess I'll stretch that out to Weaving Fate and Changeling, is, are your books ever going to be available in digital Kindle format? <laughs> so so, I, I, so I'm personally <laughs> against it. Okay. And, yeah. So I'm personally against it. Briefly, for about a year, Weaving Fate was available on Kindle. And um, I finally convinced my publisher that I really am against it. <laughs> uh, well, and, this reminds uh, me as a, like a lifelong rabid tool fan on how... <laughs> Maynard and company just would not allow their music to be bought digitally or go on a jukebox. And then one day, all of a sudden, the entire library and collection were out there. <laughs> so here's my thing. I am aware that at some point this will probably happen because the world is changing so much that at some point that is the thing. But the books always have been to me and I read books on Kindle. So I'm not, you know, I buy a bunch of, I've got 300 magic books on Kindle. That's mostly where I buy magic books unless I know they're heavily illustrated. Um, for me, it has always been really important that they be physical things you can hold. Hmm. Um, for you or the allies? <laughs> that well that is where we get to the allies and me are in agreement here um i talked about this a little bit the last kind of podcast i did was on the heathen's journey i think is what it's called siri vincent yeah i listened well, to that also um, a very good show out there folks need and, to find another one and we uh we're talking about magical books and we were talking about, uh, you know, Scandinavian black books in particular, but also the long lost friend. And then at the end, kind of integrating this to the black book of weaving fate. Um, one of the things that I have always felt, and it's because of when I came up in magic, when I came up in magic, you could get, and this is no shade whatsoever on Sybil Leak or Aleister Crowley or Israel or Gardy or who else was actually available. Starhawk. These are all people that I respect what they did in their time, even if I don't like them. Mm -hmm. Mr. Crowley. Um, uh, okay. With the rest of them, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I just have Crowley issues. I admit it. Same. I go to, a, I go to a group for it, but it hasn't yeah. taken yet. Um, you know, uh, There was something so important to me because I you could get Xeroxed books, you know these were the books were bootlegged before they were digitized uh, yes, they everywhere, were. and so a number of books that I wanted I had forms of that images and oracles of Austin Osman Spare being one of them in my mind one of the more amazing books ever printed about that relates to magic, um, and unfortunately usually terribly expensive but uh, a fucking great book. Um, these things have power. This world that we can touch has power. And as we were talking earlier, the va you don't have mental power. <laughs> this is what the allies are going to get in here. <laughs> and so this is the shit they tell me. They're like, you don't have mental power. You have a body that has a brain that produces 
power. That's not mental power. That's physical. That's tangible. You can touch it. Um, you can manipulate it. Um, a physical cup has power. Um, this is different than the painting of a cup or the cup in your mind. And all of them are important. But this is different. Um, and I'm holding up my coffee cup for anybody that <laughs> is not Lonnie. I love um, the green mug. <laughs> the lovely green mug. Um, your physical book that you are working out of or working with and taking notes in has power and is essentially if you actually use it. Like when I see, like you know this, because you, you sh I think you showed one of the, on, one, we've shared, there, maybe you shared it on your Facebook or something early on uh, after I'd say, after you'd read Six Ways, you held it up and it was full of post it notes. Oh, um, dog ears. I dog ear the dog fuck ears, out of books. Ears. People hate me for it. So, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> So, yeah. so and, and people have shared tons of these books that are just like massively underlined, highlighted, dog-eared, post-it markers, all this stuff. When I see that, I don't think, ooh, I'm cool because people are, are, care that much about what I say. I see that and I go, talisman. Yeah. Yeah. That's the fucking power object now. Um. Somebody sent me some pictures of uh, Weaving Fate and their copy of Weaving Fate is where they write their, is where they actually put their sigils. Oh, okay. So this thing's got hundreds of sigils in the margins, in the white spaces, on the images. Very and I'm cool. like, this guy gets it. Mm -hmm. So will it happen? It probably will happen. I'm not really into it. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of like why there's no international editions uh, done. It's like, I don't speak any other language, so I don't know that what I'm trying to say will be translated in a way that is accurate because I also use words a little weird to begin with. Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, a related thing. But yeah, maybe someday again. I don't know. Uh, my preference is no. I would kind of like to be... <laughs> the book that that didn't happen with. I get it. I totally get it. All the same reasons I buy certain books one way and totally know, for real. And others I get digitally. I like, I oh, totally, yeah, totally. So like I have, yeah. I have lots of books digitally, but like I'm just holding this up for anybody. Sounds of infinity. Lee Morgan's books. I have them physically because yeah. Lee creates books that are fucking power objects. And uh, yeah, holding up, Sounds of Infinity just started it. Fucking Lee Morgan rocks. Nice. Buy their books. <laughs> All right. I think this is a great spot to wrap up the regular portion of the show. Before we do. And of course, I always like to ask at the end of the regular portion, is there something that maybe... I didn't bring up that you wanted to talk about or any parting thoughts or anything you want to share before we go on. Um, well, let me think if there is anything. Um, no, you know, I am not widely on social media at this point, but, uh, I am on Instagram because that's one that doesn't bug me. And let me pull that <laughs> up because it's different than what it used to be. Yeah, and make sure you're not bombarding the man with messages, please. Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at, for Aiden Walker, it's the Aiden underscore Walker is the address for my Instagram. And yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not heavy in the DMs, but it all gets read, and uh, sometimes it makes it into these conversations and into books, and probably <laughs> if I restart the blog, it'll make it into there. So. Okay. And uh, the uh, site is still AidenWalker.com. And, yep. and that slowly, slowly will start shifting out of my I am gone in a hiding in the woods mode into uh, something a little more active. So, mm -hmm. okay. Cool. All right. Well, it has been awesome having you back here. Uh, I know you and I, you know, our friendship is beyond this show and everything, but just to have you back on the platform, I know people are going to go 
fucking bananas over this. Well, I'm super glad that I get to do the yeah. first one with you. Yeah. Coming back, it's great because I always enjoy it. Awesome. Um, for everyone out there, uh, first of all, for those of you who submitted questions, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to allow more of that into the episodes because I like hearing the, the kind of thoughts that all of you out there that listen are having and maybe it's something I'll never think of because we all have our unique experiences when we're up against this stuff. So um, thank you for that. And my, my email is always open to, to every one of you uh, weird web radio at gmail.com. Hit me up anytime you want. Um, other than that, if you want to hear the rest of this conversation, you're going to have to go to patreoncom slash weird web radio or go to weird web radio.com and click join the membership uh, Aiden and I are going to dig into um, some deeper, more philosophical thoughts today centered around devotional, magical, when does it all slide into religion, when is it not, and those boundaries and, and thoughts thereof and see where we go with it. That's happening on Patreon, friends. So come hit us up and you know where to find us. Stay weird out there. And now it is that bonus audio time. Aiden Walker, I think this is trip number five. (laughs) I don't know. Trip number a lot. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, even on the shows, you're not the guest. You, you're sub, you come up as a subject for the, the audio. If anyone listened to the whole outro is uh, me talking about like, Hey, do you want to hear how they just answered that question? What famous person's resting place do they most like to visit? We've asked you that before, but I thought about this. I haven't asked it for a while. So what famous magical person's resting place would you most like to visit? I have to come up with a new one because I've always said the same thing. and I'm not going to do that today. They're the occult dead folks. (laughs) So there's, I had this experience and we may have talked about it. I don't know. I don't know yet. (laughs) Um, But the first time I. Do you want to hear how they just answered that question? What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? That and many others, including what they think about the afterlife, what they may or may not do in cemeteries, what are their traditions, magical practices that have to do with the dead, folklore that surrounds their homes, and so much more, available for only $5. $5 a month. Even if I make more than one episode in a month, it's still just $5 a month at patreon.com slash weird web radio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership you can find me on instagram at weird web radio you can find me on facebook as weird web radio or come join the new fun and exciting weird web radio facebook group thank you again for being here stay weird out there my friends weird.